and let's start right away. So in the spirit of collaborations, um, this was actually a collaboration across multiple teams within um, Google. The M teams, like, um, that work on V8 and actually people that work on the browser. So I kind of got the chance to work on both. So this is the story. Um, I want to talk about four things here, mainly. Um, I want to kind of provide an introduction of what the actual problem is, how the web looks like, JavaScript, Chrome, the browser, how all these modules interact with each other. Then there is this cycle problem, which, well, others have dis discovered it too. It's like bro other browsers, probably also um, the guys working on Flash there. And yeah, how we solved it with cross, we call cross component garbage collection and then some background. I guess the main point is still, though, um, how the web works and how this cycle problem, how you can encounter that. That should actually be pretty general. The spoiler, if you are running latest uh, stable Chrome version, then you are already running with cross-component garbage collection as we implemented it. So this was actually a project that was started off by an intern and then um, taken over by me and development of this took rough, roughly a, a year right now. All right, the web, JavaScript, and Chrome. So many buttons. The web, the web as we see it, is actually what is defined in the specification using web IDL, and it's called the document object model. It's cross-platform language independent description of what the web is, what HTML is. Um, traditionally, somewhere, obviously, this is then implemented as concrete objects, usually in the renderer. Chrome, this is Blink, and Blink is written in C++, so you would have a representation of each of those types specified in the web IDL, you would have a C++ object for that. JavaScript, well, I would say JavaScript is the language of the web. Um, people might disagree here, but it's ubiquitous, right? So, and you can already see that on this very small example. This is JavaScript, but it's already connected to the web somehow, to the DOM. When we say document create element, what we mean here is take the document DOM node and call create element on this one and with diff you get a new diff uh, node back. So it's not only a language, it's quite, quite heavily connected to what is the DOM and what is actually HTML. So, well, this example should be pretty obvious. Um, on window node, we're just creating a new diff and we appending, we're appending that to um, the document spot. Before diving into this example, it's actually very small, but it's already interesting. Um, let's talk a minute about Chrome, at least at the runtime view of Chrome. So, Chrome is this huge software project. It's actually, it, it's a scheduler, it has various levels of memory management, it has pretty much everything you can imagine it. But under the hood, what, what it is actually is, is like it's separated in several components. It has a browser component, it has a renderer component, and part of the renderer component is also V8, the JavaScript VM. And at runtime, you instantiate multiple renderers, basically. Um, the idea is pretty simple. The software project is huge. The only way you can manage that is by abstracting into components. And actually, it's a very rough overview here. Even V8 itself is structured in like several subcomponents, like you can imagine. Compilers of various sorts, GC, a runtime system, various levels of debugging systems. So it's all a uh, pre layer, I would say. So, <clears throat> how does this all interact? You have V8 on the one side with its JavaScript objects, and you have what we call an embedder, it's basically Chrome and Blink specifically in this case, that kind of makes use of V8's API and has its own object structure, right? And in, in between there is this bindings layer. And at some point, usually you, you want to connect those, right? You want to write your JavaScript, and actually what you want to do with JavaScript is mutate the DOM, um, which it happens to be in the render. So there has to be some connection, and there is this, I call it a black box still, um, the bindings layer that does all sorts of crazy things um, with different types of references. You have this thing in between. But on a very high level, this is what the example um, from before would look like, right? You have your document, you have your body, and you have um, a diff element that got created on the renderer side, and you have your JavaScript um, objects as representations in the VM. 
just one step back, um, V8 and Blink, um, you probably don't know, but they, well, you probably know about V8 as a garbage collector because it's well known, right? Uh, right? So, but you probably don't know, but also Blink has a garbage collector since quite some time now. So you have a managed heap in Blink and you have a managed heap in V8. Both of, I mean, they are um, are compact GCs, but they are very different, right? You have this super high performance GC on the V8 side, using incremental marking, concurrent sweeping, on, and parallel compaction. And you have, well, a reasonable um, GC on the Blink side, I would say. Reasonable because it's, it's very well enough for what the DOM um, needs, right? It has incremental sweeping and some sort of compaction, but still, the architecture is sort of different. And the takeaway should be that these are very different systems and somehow they have to communicate with each other, but still maintain their own integrity, right? So um, V8 can perform a garbage collection on its own, and so can Blink. But still, in the end, by triggering um, a series of garbage collections, you should be able to clean up that. Now. That's the ultimate goal. So the cycle problem, or what we call the cycle problem, it's actually pretty simple. Um, this very complicated example, we can reduce that, right? We only need two objects, um, one in each component, and we can talk about components A and B and single objects in them. And suppose we have some live object, which is the black one here, and some reference pointing to it, and this one also points to the um, object that's interesting here in, in component A. And intuitively, well, it's pointed to from a live object, this one should be live, and if there is a cross-component reference, what we call it, um, to um, the object in component B, well, then if you have a global view of that system, all of these objects should be live, right? Intuitively. <clears throat> Let's take a step back, though, and suppose we only have the view of system B, and there is this incoming reference here, and we don't really know about anything, any of the object structure in component A, so the only way we can basically get around by not collecting this thing here is by declaring all incoming references as roots, roots and thus making those objects live. On the other hand, well, the problem is though, actually, you don't know what's going on on the other side, so it might very well be that this reference comes from a dead object. So, obviously, you could have reference in this direction too, and from the view of component A, you also don't know anything about B, right? So the only way you can possibly design this by only knowing stuff in A is making this thing a root so we cannot collect it. And then if you have your global view again, well, this you just created a cycle and you have two dead objects that are not referenced by anywhere else and you can't collect the cycle. This is obviously very bad. Um, because it will just create um, memory leaks in the browser, and this is actually what happened in Chrome to some extent. And this is what we are uh, we actually fixed. So some observations and well, let's call them observations. Manually breaking the cycles using weak uh, references. Some of you suggested that already. Um, it might not be possible in all cases. It's simply if an object has to stay alive via its semantics, you have to make this a strong reference. You might be able to break these cycles manually if you really knew the object structure beforehand, but since the bindings layer creates objects of the same types for different reasons, there is no way you can know that what, what a reference type should be, whether it should be a strong one. So we have to find another way. Also another observation, this is very similar to the general cycle problem you have with reference counts. We just have to collect those cycles. And there is lots of algorithms and literature out there that actually can do that. And the general theme here is, you have to provide more information to the system. You have to provide this global view. And this is actually what, what we do, right? So for cross, you have to provide cross-component information at some point to break these cycles automatically. So, and in this sense, all this cross-component garbage collection does is provide and process liveness information across component boundaries. So you have an API, somebody implements that API, and they can inform you how their heap structure looks like, or how you can trace it, for example, and then you can resolve those cycles. Very interesting observation, 
you only need to uh, break one of those links, right? So if you manage to break the link from B to A, at some point you can collect the object in A and then the one in B will also be gone. So it's, it's enough to, to break one of those links. On a very, very high level, you just need to return for each object across component boundaries all objects that are transitively reachable from a given object. How would it look like? Again, you have your cycle, but this time suppose we actually have a live object there. What we do is, or what you're supposed to do is, you get to your live object that has a cross-component reference. You then announce this somehow to component B. This one knows how to properly trace its heap, its managed heap, and then report basically back to so, um, the objects that are reachable. If we wouldn't have this first object here, then this whole cycle could be collected because there is no entry. How you would do it in, in, in the real world is a bit different though. So it's very nice to have this one API call where you get the transitive closure. Um, in essence, in a practical system, in a high performance system like V8 and Chrome is, you have to do batch based communication and you have to have some sort of control of any tracing because you want to trace in this way. So what it actually boils down is very simple. We have two calls that are used to announce objects in, in one um, in a direction. You have this register references, which basically allows communicating objects into the embedder heap and register externally referenced objects in the other direction. And then you have this advanced tracing call, which embedder, in this case Chrome, has to implement, um, which V8 calls, and then we can just trace objects in the embedder heap. You can already see here that since you can call advanced tracing, you can call this tracing method, there is something going on. In the background, um, a very short interlude here about incremental marking. Um, for those of you who don't know, incremental marking lets us get away without marking the whole transitive code at once, but we can mark it in several pieces. What you need is a sort of structure to hold object information, which is a marking EQ. You need three colors, you can get away with less uh, in certain cases. Basically, objects that you don't know anything of are white. Objects on the marking DQ that will still be processed are gray. And objects that are done with processing are black. And then you can um, basically, each time JavaScript is done, uh, you can mark some objects. And those basically transition from white to gray to black. What's needed there is um, so-called barriers of whatever sort, we will get to that, um, to ensure consistency because there are certain problems that can arise in this phase where JavaScript is running, and you need a driver that ensures progress. So for consistency, um, basically there are many, if, if you know the GC literature, there are many ways to actually solve this. We just chose to have the right barrier, and we are preserving strong, the strong pre-color and barrier. What this means is that there are no black to white edges, which means that upon assigning an object um, to a slot in another object, we check the colors and if the, the um, object where, which, where the value would be assigned happens to be already black, well then you have to process the, the value. Um, this is nothing, nothing new, so this is known literature, we just, this is what um, happens to be implemented by us. The key problem though is, this is also pretty new, um, Right barriers, you, you want to, you, well, you need to place them, and it's, it's uh, in a C++-based system that's not designed for this kind of stuff. It's hard because you tend to forget those barriers. Every time you assign a value, you would need to check the right barrier. The idea um, that we have there is to basically use sort of smart pointers, um, which basically on each right, copy construction, move, and all sorts of things um, perform the right area. And the whole tracing system only accepts those types. Um, so you cannot get away without them. If you would use a raw pointer, it doesn't work, the compiler will, uh, will scream at you. Um, this way we actually successfully annotated 250 fields in the link um, down tree, which doesn't sound a lot, but uh, Recall that these are these are only um, the declarations, not uses. Uses would have been way more difficult because those 250 fields are used all over the place, and it would be a nightmare to actually find the correct places where you need to the right area. So, with this system in place, we actually uh, constructed a, a we, we constructed a system that is correct by design by using the C++ type system. 
some benchmarking and results. And so far, I've not told you about what actually was implemented before. It's a bit hand waving here. Um, the system is called object grouping. The important thing here is that you basically create groups of live objects. These groups are not enough to collect all these cycles. You end up still with some memory leaks, and you cannot do that well incrementally. So you got rid of this system. If you are really interested in what's, what has been going on there, you can ask me offline. I'm happy to provide some more information. But it's, it's gone now. So one minute on benchmarking, and then I'll be done. Um, how do we do that? Basically, we are interested in real-world workloads. So you see there is this telemetry or catapult benchmarking framework, which basically perform workloads that people might actually do in the browser. We trace every single GC event, and well, since browsers happen to be very big pieces of software with lots of noise in them, we have to do hypothesis testing with rank some tests and so on. And it turns out, so some results. We can, using this system instead of the other system that it groups in a magic way, um, we can reduce the average latency critical GC pause, actually the atomic pause, by 15% on, for example, roughly 15 with Facebook as well. And y axis here is improvement in percent on the median. It has also some impact on other, other websites. Not so much or not significant according to the ranks on tests um, on, for example, Flickr. The finalization, this is black box for now. Um, object grouping couldn't be done in the finalization pause, or actually it could be, but it was very expensive, and we reduced that pause by almost 100%. So um, on most websites, so this basically this pause is gone. So these are the good parts. Where did we trade off? There is no free lunch. Um, we trade it off in general marking time. So the system I just showed you, with the right barriers in place, you can do almost everything incrementally, but and that's actually what we do to save um, time in the atomic pause. Um, and this is where we, we trade off, this is where we pay. If there are any questions, happy to answer them. Since you traded off on the total marking time, not on yes. the on the side of the increment of the Oh uh, no, the increment is actually fixed, or at least, well, it's bounded. So in V8 we have several heuristics. We start off with very small marking phases, and then have, if we have to catch up, we increase those phases. But we are always within those limits. Yes. So basically, for there's no perceivable no uh, impact for the time. Yeah. There. yeah, there should not. Otherwise, it would be bad. So you didn't mention. How did the problem was in the first place? I guess you can, I didn't catch that. Like, how, how much garbage gets created in the normal research? The, the problem is, so in general, what object grouping does um, is group together DOM trees, which sounds actually quite reasonable. The problem is, though, as soon as you have one callback, JavaScript callback, sorry, that references between those DOM trees, you create an object leak. Um, it's, not, it's hardly noticeable on benchmarks. But in real world scenarios, you often tend to get these bug reports. Hey, Chrome is super slow, the heap is large, what's going on there? Turns out, you trigger these cases in the wild, and then it's really hard to debug, and this is what we actually wanted to get rid of. Plus, um, um, object grouping really was not well designed in, a, in <coughs> respect to incremental behavior. So you had to do almost everything in the atomic pause, or in, in at least large steps. And this is definitely perceivable on the user side. Like the system we designed now is completely incremental with um, small bounds and incremental steps, so you don't notice anything about your question process. Any more questions? Well, let's end the speaker again.